www.globalstrategyforum.org. Just a few notes before we begin. Many of you are joining us for both sessions today. If you are, there will be a 15 minute virtual coffee break at 12.45, which means you can actually go off and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, whatever it takes your fancy, but you will need to log in again at 1 p.m. promptly with a second set of Zoom joining in the details, which you should have received already in your confirmation email. We'll be tweeting the event on GSF's Twitter account using the hashtag GSF events day. So do follow us if you would like to and join in, our, in on Twitter as well. Turning to our first event today, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me today, Sir David Omond, who is currently a visiting professor in the War Studies Department at King's College London and a PSIA Sciences Po in Paris, where he teaches intelligence studies. He's also been a vice president of RUSI and is now a distinguished fellow. He's had an extraordinary distinguished career at the highest level of government service. His posts, just to remind you, included United Kingdom Security and Intelligence Coordinator, Permanent Secretary at the Home Office, and Director of GCHQ, the United Kingdom Signals Intelligence and Cybersecurity Organization. He's also been an author of, first of all, a book called Securing the State, uh, published by Hearst in 2010, and Principled Spying, The Ethics of Secret Intelligence, OUP 2018. David is here today to talk to us about his latest book, How Spies Think, 10 Lessons in Intelligence, which is being published by Penguin Viking on the 29th of October, I believe. I was lucky enough to read an advanced copy, and I must say it's an absolutely fascinating book, part memoir, part intelligence and espionage history, and part manual on analytical reasoning and psychological behavior. It's a terrific read, and I very much recommend you, when you can, to go out and buy a copy. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Dave is going to speak to us, to start with, for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then he and I will have a conversation, and I hopefully will be putting to him some of the questions you would have put through to us. Please do use the chat function to submit questions, and I will aim to put as many as possible to our speaker. So as you listen to his presentation, if you think of any questions, let us know. I can't think of anyone I would rather have to open the GSF's 2021 events program. And so without further ado, David, I'm going to ask you to talk to us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, for that very generous introduction. What I want to do in the next 10 minutes is really explain why I came to write this book. I wrote it really to try and help people to take sound evidence-based decisions because we all have big personal decisions to take at times and even apparently small decisions such as whether to wear a face mask in the street this afternoon are decisions that affect the welfare of others. So let me start with the question, what do we need to know to take solid evidence-based decisions? And I think COVID-19, which appeared after I'd written the book, makes that a highly topical question. As you pointed out, I used to run GCHQ. I spent seven years as a member of the Joint Intelligence Committee that since 1936 has been trying to provide government what it needs to know to inform national security decisions. And I think we can all learn from their approach and also from why on occasion they get it wrong. When it comes to making a decision, we have to bring together in our own head two different kinds of thought. On the one hand, rational analysis of the situation we're in, and on the other, the ambitions for what we want to achieve by our choice or what outcomes we fear and want to avoid. Both kinds of thought, the dispassionate analysis and uh, the passionate determination, the is and the ought, need to be understood if we're going to make sound operational decisions. That has always been hard, 
But now, of course, when we go online to seek more information, what faces us is emotionally manipulative, contradictory, and sometimes deliberately false information from more sources than ever. And that's as true about preparing to make choices in the polling booth as it is for deciding on COVID-19 lockdown rules. We are sadly, I think, heading for a world where telling the literal truth is no longer as important as creating the desired emotional impact. I would like it to be true, becomes with constant repetition, it might be true, and that slides too easily into it's as good as true. So the purpose of having intelligence is to improve our decisions by reducing our degree of ignorance of what we face. For our remote ancestors, no doubt, is that rustling in the bush over there lunch, or are we to be its lunch? Now, my observation uh, over all those years of working in the defense and security intelligence worlds is that there are four routes to reduce ignorance by using intelligence. And together they form the first part of the book. It's what I've called the SEES model of intelligence, S-E-E-S, -E -E providing four essential outputs to the decision maker, situational awareness, explanation, estimation, and strategic notice. And the first four chapters of the book looks at each of these kinds of output in turn. Situational awareness comes from accessing data about what's happening on the ground or in cyberspace, answering the sort of factual questions that tend to start with what, when, and where. And we all need reliable, consistent situational awareness of what we face before we start arguing about what policy choices we may have about what to do about a situation. Just think about COVID. But of course, the first lesson of my 10 lessons. The first lesson that intelligence analysts learn is that our knowledge of the world is always fragmentary and incomplete and sometimes wrong. The British intelligence community, I'm delighted to say, has put significant effort into building systems to provide better situational awareness of the activities of all the people who mean us harm, the hostile autocrats and terrorists and narcotics and human traffickers and cyber gangs and all the rest, all intent on doing things that will harm us and all going to great lengths to try and prevent us knowing what they're up to. So secret intelligence for government is needed to steal the secrets of those who mean us harm. And the data points being sought are identities and biometrics and associates and networks and locations and movements and so on. In national security, having situational awareness really does matter. I recount in the book uh, the uh, story of the Falklands, uh, where Margaret Thatcher would have woken on the 2nd of April 1982 to discover a fait accompli with Argentine forces in control of the Falklands and her own head on the political block, had it not been for GCHQ intercepts earlier in the week, revealing that an Argentine invasion force had set sail for Port Stanley, showing resolve by having the task force ready to announce when the fact of the invasion became public, I believe saved her government. And I describe in the book the moment when, in her room in the House of Commons, I showed her those three key GCHQ intercepts. And I certainly won't forget telephoning the duty commander in the Ministry of Defence later from her room to pass on the historic order, ready the fleet for sea. But there's a second lesson in intelligence, and that is that facts need explaining. They are capable of multiple interpretations, as every defense lawyer knows, was the reason the accused fingerprints were found on the petrol bomb thrown at the police because he threw it, or was it just his old wine bottle that the mob spotted as they passed the recycling bin outside his house? So explanation is the second output of intelligence analysis needed to support good decisions and answering objectively questions 
uh, that start with how and why. Why do we now think Russia was responsible for the NotPetya cyber attack? How did it end up costing global biz business over $10 billion and nearly destroying the world's largest shipping company? Providing a sound evidence-based explanation involves methodically testing alternative hypotheses against the data. I go into this in the book. You look for the uh, explanation with the least evidence against it. Since if you look hard enough, as sadly was done in the run-up to the war in 2000, with Iraq in 2003, you can always find some evidence that appears to support an argument. And that's also how conspiracy theories thrive. But it should only take one really solid piece of contrary evidence to knock down an explanation. Now, explanation is hard. You need access to background knowledge, foreign language skills, history, geography, anthropology, psychology, current affairs. And the explanation often boils down to assessing the motivation behind some observed act. For example, why does Russia use the illegal nerve agent Novichok as a murder weapon, given that its use points straight back to Moscow? With a sound evidence-based explanation, however, we can be more confident in moving on to estimate, a word I think that intelligence analysts prefer to predict, how events may unfold and to model how others might respond to possible decisions. The third lesson in intelligence is therefore that to estimate, you need a good explanatory model, not just sufficient data, uh, we've seen some of this kind of argument over COVID as well. So estimates and modeling are the third component of my C's model needed to answer vital questions about what's likely to happen next if we do or if we do not act in a particular way. And this is going to be particularly important for gray zone operations under uh, uh, the Chief of Defense Staff, General Nick Carter's new defense integrated strategic operating concept that will see the UK in persistent engagement with our adversaries in cyberspace. Our estimates of how events might unfold will depend on good situational awareness and the soundness of our explanation and on the assumptions uh, we may have adopted about how key individuals are likely to behave again COVID relevance there uh, on the assumptions about mask wearing or uh, abiding by the rule of six. In the book, I use the example of the Bosnian Serb army commander, General Mladic, the so-called butcher of Srebrenica. I was a member of the Joint Intelligence Committee and after the massacre uh, on 11th July at Srebrenica, we had to try and estimate what he would do next. Two weeks later, I was in the air with Air Chief Marshal Paddy Hine, Commander-in-Chief of RAF Strike Command, along with our American and French opposite numbers, on a secret visit to Serbia to meet Mladic in a villa outside Belgrade. Our mission was to warn Mladic that any further moves against the UN safe areas would result in US, British and French air power being unleashed on him and his forces and to assess from his response whether he would heed the warning. We had uh, agreed the airmen would wear their aviator sunglasses and their leather bomber jackets to increase the sense of menace. And we'd agreed we would not touch the hospitality, the sweetmeats and slivovich that we knew would be offered, a refusal that would signal our seriousness. Actually, Mladic made it very easy to assess his motivation. Increasingly angry, he tore open his shirt and uh, with a cry of, kill me now if you must, but no foreign boot will desecrate the graves of my ancestors. And he read us his handwritten account of the tribulations of the Serb people since their defeat at the hands of the Ottoman army in 1389 in the Battle of the Field of Blackbirds. He then delivered a racist rant 
that the Bosnian Muslims, or Turks as he called them, had no right to be in his country and he was determined to drive them out. We flew back late at night from our mission, having reached our assessment that to stop his ethnic cleansing, nothing short of full-scale NATO intervention would do, which of course is what happened. Mladic is now serving a life sentence for crimes against humanity. Finally, to complete the outputs of the C's model, I suggest we need strategic notice of possible future challenges that might come and hit us. Strategic notice helps military and procurement planning, helps answer important questions of the how could we best prepare for whatever might appear next type, or even how could we preempt this risk so that it never comes to test us. Most of the information needed to provide strategic notice can be provided from open sources, but sometimes underpinned and confirmed by sensitive secret intelligence. The fourth lesson in intelligence is therefore that we do not have to be so surprised by surprise itself. And again, the COVID experience uh, tells us a lot here. To conclude, Buddhists teach there are three poisons that cripple the mind, anger, attachment, and ignorance. Emotions such as anger can blind us to what is true and what is false. Attachment to old ideas with which we find, feel comfortable and that falsely reassure us that the world is predictable can blind us to threatening developments. That is what causes us to be taken by surprise but it's ignorance that is the most damaging mental poison and the purpose of rational analysis, such as through the C's model I've described, is to reduce such ignorance, thereby enabling us to safeguard our future. Thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, you've covered a great deal of fascinating ground. and Indeed, there's more covered in the book. Yes. But uh, there's many, many questions I think I could ask you, but I hope we'll get some outside as well. One of the things which struck me um, is if you look back over the last 30 years, talking about knowledge and gaining a realization of what the facts are, must be much more difficult today than it was then because of the various ways in which we try and assess what is the truth. We have all this social media, uh, or which we, you know, we read about uh, fake news as some people will call it, how do we actually begin by working out through that what the starting point of what I think you called was sensational awareness is? I would have to recognize to start with that you know, the, the past was not a golden age. Uh, we had less information, just as historians had access to rather less uh, data, uh, information in the archives. But you kind of made the best of the small amount you had. The problem we have today is you've got too much information and too much of it is, as you say, uh, misleading or false or deliberately false. And in the book, I, the second part of the book is really about how you get it wrong, how you misunderstand what you're looking at, cognitive, various cognitive biases, um, confirmation bias, for example, uh, how you can be deliberately deceived. And there are sadly some examples in the intelligence world of that. Um, but also how you can fall into a, a conspiratorial way of looking at all this information. And that's the bit that we see today on social media that I find most worrying. If you take COVID-19, the uh, Facebook uh, is blocking almost millions of entry um, posts, which are putting out entirely false information. For example, linking the pandemic, the disease, to 5G mobile masts, causing people to go out, about 40 cases in the UK, and attack mobile phone masts because they think it's spreading the disease in some way. I mean, this is, you might say, it's close to madness, uh, but it's the emotional impact of the material that is on social media that uh, as it were, has that additional effect. It's not just its truth value. If it was just about truth value, you could simply knock down the, the, the nonsense. But as we see, 
even knocking it down doesn't, doesn't stop it spreading. Um, and uh, the stories we have about the origins of COVID-19 manufactured in a US weapons lab, stories like that spread like wildfire. Now, <laughs> you're entitled to ask, what do you do about it? Well, I've got a chapter in the book where I have a stab at some of the things we could do, but it, this is work in progress. I don't think anyone really has a full agenda. But one of the first things we need to do is, you know, how much of this stuff is there? Who's pushing it out? Is it being remotely uh, amplified by automated bots of the kind that the Russians were using when they were trying to influence the 2016 US presidential ele election? So we can find out more and then try and be more selective about how we go about persuading the uh, big internet companies to build machines which will find it and scrub it and, and remove it. And they're beginning to do that. Uh, quite a lot of material, even, even uh, President Trump, some of his tweets about COVID, uh, Twitter have put a health warning on because their policies, they won't allow the retweeting of material uh, that uh, could be potentially damaging or dangerous in response uh, to the health of the public. Presumably who's putting it out must be a very important question, whether it's just yeah. individuals yeah. who happen to be able to use the media in that way, whether there is a concerted attempt, say by China or Russia. How, how are you ever going to really be able to discern that? I think it will, it's a very good question. <laughs> And there's always going to be a little bit of doubt. Um, but one of the themes of the book is that it is possible to analyze all the sources of information that are available to you, uh, including your intelligence base, and arrive at reasoned judgments and almost put the odds on it. You know, I think I am very confident that. It's rare you'll be absolutely certain, but you're confident enough to recommend to a government that measures should be taken. And that was the case with the Novichok attack in, in Salisbury, for, for example. Um, the intelligence uh, community is going to have to try and find out more about those who are responsible for this kind of activity. Um, what they did to try and cut down on uh, terrorist uh, propaganda, uh, death videos and such like, was very impressive when ISIS was, uh, the so-called Islamic State was underway, and they intervened very actively. That's, I think, the only recorded case where there's, there's been a real pushback against people exploiting social media to spread totally unacceptable material. Mm -hmm. So that perhaps gives some pointers uh, to what needs to be done. Just <laughs> in the book, I also have to say, I do suggest that we have to start rather earlier in our education of our citizens, preferably at school. I can't understand why it isn't a compulsory subject in school, how to stay safe online and how to be more critical in assessing the material that you're going to see. In the past, we've sort of given that sort of training to historians, you know, doing A-level history. But now you've got to give it to every school child because they, they all have access to social media and some of what is on social media is poisonous. On the other hand, let me very quickly reassure you, Michael, that uh, lots of good things about the internet and our economy depends on it. Our social interactions during COVID depend on it. I'm glad we have it, but we've got to learn to curb its dark side. You, you talk about uh, the Bayesian reasoning or inference, which is a phrase I hadn't come across before. And in the course of that, you talk about a rather interesting uh, moment when Tony Blair was able, using it to work out your defence background. Would you like to remind us about that? Yes, I mean, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, uh, Tunbridge Wells, 18th century Tunbridge Wells clergyman, very interesting man. Um, he clearly was one of those hobbyists who worked, uh, as so many in that period uh, did, uh, on his own account in mathematics and, and uh, 
uh, reasoning uh, philosophy. Um, and amongst his papers, after he died, they found this manuscript, which was his solution to the sort of inverse uh, probability problem. So, I mean, if you roll a dice, you know, you can work out sort of six faces and you can work out the chances of getting two or three sixes in a row from the model. But what if you, as it were, spot a run of sixes? Can, what can you infer about the, uh, the, the fairness of the die or the coin or the roulette wheel or whatever? And that's the problem that Bayes was, was, was tackling going backwards. And he came up with this wonderful formula which is uh, essentially you, you alter, when new evidence arrives, you alter your belief in the proposition in proportion to the extent to which the evidence that you come, the new evidence would only be found if your uh, uh, supposition was true. I mean, put in words, it sounds blindingly obvious. And in a sense, it is blindingly obvious, but it has revolutionized statistics and it's the basis on which all these digital algorithms we hear about, that it's, it's Bayesian influence. They are using from the evidence, working uh, backwards to uh, what is the likely cause of that evidence having appeared. So anyway, to your <laughs> story, which I'm not quite sure why I put in the book, but it was uh, one of the uh, first on being introduced to Tony, um, and he said, well, I can tell you come from defense or the foreign office, I think he said. I said, how do you know? Well, you have, you're wearing shiny black shoes and they've been cleaned recently and the rest of Whitehall had gone scruffy. <laughs> um, and this is because of uh, constant contact over the years with, with uh, military officers, I think, uh, working in the Ministry of Defense. But what if you stopped uh, a, a civil servant at random in Whitehall, um, you could work out what chance is it that they come from the Ministry of Defence by statistics, proportion of civil service employed in, in Ministry of Defence. But then you notice the shiny shoes. How would you use that new evidence to recalibrate your uh, original purely uh, statistical calculation? And it's, it's very easy to do the calculation. I put it in the book, but I won't bore you with it now. I think we'll all be trying it in the future, see how we get to. Um, the second of your uh, E's in the SES was explanation. Um, and you referred, which rather interested me, to the case in the Iraq, or the lead up to the Iraq war, of an agent called Curveball. And what, what I think you're saying is that we have to somehow disassociate ourselves from what might be our natural instinctive wish to believe something to examine it in another way. Would you like to say a word or two about Curveball? Yes, uh, he was uh, an Iraqi engineer who uh, before, the wars, before the war turned up in uh, Germany uh, the German intelligence service had a sort of system for screening refugees. Uh, so they, they discovered this chap was uh, a chemical engineer and they started to question him about uh, uh, Saddam's uh, biological warfare programs. And it turned out that this individual had worked on Saddam's real biological warfare programs the first time around at the time of the first Gulf. Um, so they kept him uh, 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 they interrogated, or not interrogated, they questioned him, debriefed him, I think you'd probably say. And hundred, uh, almost, I think, a hundred reports came out. And these were passed to the uh, United States, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and to our own intelligence authorities. And they revealed uh, an ongoing biological warfare program uh, mobile biological warfare factories, you know, mobile units for producing it, locations, a stream of extremely detailed information. The only problem was he'd made it up. He used his own background on the program, so it's highly credible. Um, but he had 
as he admitted in a BBC interview after the war was over, when they tracked him down, he wanted Saddam out. And this was his personal way of persuading the United States to give him a push to remove him. So the intelligence community fell for it. There were indeed skeptics, particularly over here, saying it's too good to be true. And this is, comes to your acute point, which is that uh, if you really want it to be true and you've been searching and searching for somebody to tell you this stuff, uh, and then it turns up, your inclination is not to say, well, it's probably a fabricator. Your inclination is probably to say, well, there's probably something in it. And a huge effort was made, particularly by our own uh, secret service, uh, to cross check and see whether his story stood up. But again, a very interesting point that every time they discovered an inconsistency, uh, in the information he provided and the facts on the ground from agents or from overhead imagery. There was always a kind of a tendency to explain it away. Well, the Iraqis are very good at deception. So they have probably moved it or they've, uh, they've concealed it in some way. Uh, and there was always an available explanation rather than face the awful truth, which eventually had to be faced that this chap had made it up. But it did significantly alter the final Joint Intelligence Committee paper on biological, his biological capability just before the war. And it was hardened up. And the only reason the judgment was hardened up was that this mass of intelligence uh, was available. So you do have to be very careful. And this sort of confirmation bias and new news, hey, one gets it with friends. If somebody says that some friend has behaved a bit like a heel, your instinct is probably to say, no, no, I know of so-and-so. I mean, I've you know, known him for 20 years. He, he wouldn't do that. But could Curve Ball occur again? Yes. Um, one's hopes that, you know, once burnt, you are a little more careful about the, the fire. But, you know, generations pass. These, one of the things I think it's why I'm so interested in teaching intelligence history is that these lessons are eternal. And every upcoming generation of analysts, we train the analysts at King's College, uh, every upcoming generation of young analysts in the British community has to be reminded of uh, some of the triumphs, but also, some, sadly, some of the failures. Uh, of their profession. It, lesson three explores the importance of looking ahead and anticipating what, what's sometimes called horizon mm -hmm. scanning. Um, at the moment, as you know, uh, the government is undertaking an integrated review of foreign policy, defence and defence security and international development, uh, which is actually, I think, fairly close to reporting mm -hmm. now. The Prime Minister had said he wanted this review to, and I quote, to overhaul the UK's approach to foreign policy and a strategic review above all seemed to me to, to the time to apply phronesis, a word I'd forgotten about if I'd ever known it. Um, you give the definition of it as anticipating the future by remembering the past and judging the present correctly. Uh, what confidence do you have that the integrated review is going to fulfill that? A little less confidence than I did have because of COVID. I think the distraction of COVID, the amount of time that senior people have had to spend over the last, inevitably means this is a slightly truncated review. So it may not go quite as deeply uh, into the questions you mentioned as perhaps it should. But uh, from what I know from the outside, um, the right questions are certainly being addressed, certainly within the Ministry of Defence. Uh, and I referred earlier to the grey zone, you know, below the threshold of armed conflict. And I'm very confident that NATO still has a good deterrent posture and we contribute to it. But below the threshold of armed conflict, there are all sorts of mischiefs. And uh, uh, the review has got to strengthen our ability to deal with some of those. Mm -hmm. Just to remind you, if, if any of you do have a question you'd like to put to 
to Sir David Oman. I think I gave the details of how to do it at the beginning, and we'd welcome them to take part in this discussion. Um, you talk in the book about the valuable, how valuable good intelligence can be, and the problems its absence causes. And one of the examples you give, and you mentioned it already, is the Falklands mm. episode. Um, there are many reasons why this happens. Do you think there are any particular warnings that you think are in danger of being ignored today? I think it's the, I, the two areas concern me um, greatly. One is Russian behavior and the risk we could almost unintentionally get into a serious, uh, serious confrontation if uh, uh, the Kremlin decides to push, uh, uh, we, we see this at the moment with Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, they're trying to uh, broker a peace, but earlier in Syria, the uh, uh, Russian uh, intervention, I don't think was at all helpful. And that could lead, so, so that's one area. Um, the other is China, which is a long-term issue. And the, China and the United States seem to be on a collision course, both over economics, uh, the Huawei affair, uh, and over control of uh, uh, the right of innocent passage sort of, uh, international waters in uh, the South China Sea. Uh, I th those are areas where you could trigger off genuine confrontation. So I, I, I worry about those, in addition to all the other hotspots which there are uh, around the world. I see that one of our uh, regular members, Sir Hoki Walker, I'm sure you, you know, mm -hmm. has sent in a question asking, apart from the writing of histories, how can the government machine incorporate lessons that they've learned? <laughs> it's a very good question. To, uh, and the answer is well, they haven't learned how to do it yet, have they? Um, and part of that is human nature. But it's funny, when I started, uh, uh, transferred from GCHQ to the Ministry of Defence and worked uh, in the Navy Department, the old Admiralty, we had things called precedent books. And every time, uh, a minister took a significant decision or officials uh, rewrote something. It went in the precedent book and it was carefully noted. And, and this was an important historical register. And if you had a new problem, you went back to the old records to check whether there were any precedents. Nowadays, that sounds absurdly quaint and old fashioned, but electronically, is it so difficult? You know, you can search masses of doctrine. So I suspect part of the answer is technology. Mm -hmm. So that uh, although things may have been done through exchanges of emails and so on, you can still write some really smart algorithms which will distill you know, what the essence mm -hmm. of that uh, decision was. That would be one way of bit of investment in some innovative thinking there. And the other is training your, the people who work there to respect the past and the, you know, the uh, experiences of the past. Um, I have noticed in the last 10 years that Whitehall has got rather more adventurous in outreach to retired members of the service and to academics saying we've got this problem that's blown up in some part of the world is is there anything you you can tell us which will actually uh, help us work out how we should approach this um so today's generation is not necessarily as perhaps my generation would have been you know you shut yourself away and you try and work it out within the Ministry of Defence, you now sort of reach out more and draw on experience. Perhaps this is just because I'm getting older <laughs> and therefore the idea of, you know, one gets consulted. But, uh, yes, I think uh, I have an instinctive view that uh, <coughs> asking people who've been through things before 
is always a good idea, even yeah. if they don't necessarily come up with the answers. Yeah, you don't <coughs> want to do it in such a way that, oh, you know, we tried that before, it didn't work, because circumstances do change. And the availability of information means that some things which wouldn't have worked 20 years ago might just work uh, today. But that idea, particularly the lived experience, um, there are some oral history projects going on in universities, which are fascinating, taking people like yourself and then sort of getting a, a dump of what it was actually like to be in Northern Ireland at that particular moment, facing those sort of political issues. Uh, and that would be invaluable. We have another question just come in from Madeline Moon, who you probably know as well. Your talk focused mainly outside of the state for threats how would you rate the threat of far-right extremism, extremism in the United Kingdom, she asks. Um, <clears throat> as I would rate it as increasing, uh, probably increasing much faster than anyone would want it. You, don't, you have to recognize there's always been some right-wing extremism, there's always been some left-wing extremism, but it seems to be a more significant factor a little more organized. And again, this comes back to one of the themes of the book of the impact of social media. In the past, somebody with a rather uh, aggressive, violent right wing views might have found themselves quite alone in their little community. But now, of course, through social media, you can very quickly find other people who share exactly your prejudices. And before you know where you are, you're beginning to imagine you're a part of a much wider group than in reality you actually are. And that is something of the phenomenon that's going on in the United States at the moment, as we see the, uh, uh, the alt-right uh, and some quite violent things being said pre-election. Pre Here, I think I've always worried since I dealt with terrorism as security and intelligence coordinator, that it would only take tragically a fairly small number of attacks on the uh, that were, as it were, uh, could uh, terrorist attacks, uh, jihadist uh, extremist attacks, could trigger a, a, a response from the right and lead to intercommunal tensions of a kind we haven't seen in generations. That I think is still. A threat. So I think the security service is right to take it seriously, start putting some resources into it. Um, <coughs> when the government last reissued the counterterrorism strategy contest that we put together after 9-11, they, for the first time, included right-wing extremism. So the counterterrorism strategy is not just focused on Al-Qaeda and the remnants of the Islamic State, it's now taking account of right-wing extremism. And I think that's, that's just sensible. In lesson four in your book, uh, you note that we had strategic notice of a possible coronavirus epidemic. And you note a virus pandemic was one of the top risks flagged up by government, together with terrorism and cyber attacks. Why do you think we were caught so unprepared if this was the case? We'll have to wait for a proper inquiry and access to the papers and so on to, to get to the bottom of it. The top right, we introduced in my time, sort of the risk matrix where you have likelihood of it and impact if it does happen. And then you group all the different uh, possible uh, threats and, and civil contingencies, one kind or another, but a lot of them. But the top right hand, so combination of likely to happen, and if it does, it will be very bad, was always the pandemic. Now, it wasn't COVID-19, that was a new disease with different characteristics, but it was the coronavirus type pandemic. Therefore, the need for protective equipment, stockpiles, uh, the need for a track and trace system that was organized in such a way that it could be very rapidly expanded rather than having to reinvent it. Uh, these don't seem to have been done. Now, was the great crash of 2007, 2008, sort of knocked people a bit sideways? 
um, was the fact that years have passed since those estimates were first made when I was doing the job meant that it hasn't happened. So there are other priorities. We'll have to wait and see. But I, I think it is a pity that it did seem to catch us, uh, catch us out. Uh, and the public health authorities hadn't convinced the paymasters to actually produce the resources, because in the end, it, what were the resources available <laughs> to public health England to actually invest in these kind of precautionary measures uh, when it wasn't immediately needed? It would be an investment against future possibility. Uh, and that's, that didn't happen. So it, it is sad. It'll, it'll be I mean, it'll be an important question actually to look into when this is over because what is the point of having this intelligence carefully worked out, carefully published, if at the end of the day nobody pays any attention to it? Yeah, um, I'm not saying it's a panacea because there are, you can't invest against every possible hmm. and there are lots of things which might happen. I mean, one of the most scary is solar flares where the sun emits streams of charged particles. They mostly miss the Earth because the Earth's orbit's going around and the particles are going off. If our orbit coincides with the, the part, that will fry most of the electronics. It will solve the social media problem because there won't be any social media because most of our electronics are completely unprotected against that kind of... Uh, now, what are the chances of it happening? The government has measured it. It's on the risk register. It's as every year passes where it hasn't happened. You know, the odds go up that in the next five years, we might see that. Now, how much would it be worth spending? You'd want to protect systems. You'd want to protect supply system public people could protect. So the, the, these are very difficult choices. I don't want to make it sound sort of easy, but what I've tried to do in the book is give us a framework of concepts and analysis so you can start to unpick these problems. And in the end, of course, it's back onto ministers' shoulders. To, where are you going to put the limited resources we've got? Another question coming, I'm not sure it's from, but the question is, what is your assessment of the strength of Chinese intelligence I don't know about processing uh, and if I did know I probably wouldn't be allowed to say but in Chinese intelligence gathering particularly digital intelligence gathering is a matter of public record because they have been caught at it time and time again they take it very seriously uh, they there are very large uh, units of the um, PLA, the uh, uh, People's Liberation Army, that are devoted to this. And we know, uh, forensically, we know that they have uh, been all over uh, British infrastructure, United States infrastructure. They've stolen intellectual property in very large amounts. The President Obama managed to reach an agreement uh, with the, uh, the Chinese president uh, that such uh, intellectual property theft uh, would be stopped uh, for commercial gain. So, you know, stealing the plans of the latest consumer gadget um, would be stamped on, that wouldn't be allowed. But they're still stealing anything that's relevant to national security. They broke into the Office of Personnel Management in Washington that holds the records of every US federal employee, including the employees of the intelligence agencies and their betting records and stole it all. I mean, that is brazen and extraordinarily competent too, to be able to do it. Um, I dare say the protective security was not good enough. Uh, some lessons will have been learned, but that's the kind of scale of espionage that goes on. You have another question come in from Richard Ballarand. How dangerous is a disconnect between an intelligence service and its national leader? And he refers to Trump or Wilson in that regard. I think it's extremely dangerous if you get to a situation where the leader uh, 
doesn't trust the intelligence community uh, in any one of a number of ways. Doesn't trust them to tell the truth. That's clearly disastrous. Uh, doesn't trust them to be politically neutral, which is the problem, I think, in the United States, where they, we had this with Richard Nixon, uh, where his view of the CIA was, I can't speak on the language was, uh, which you, you can hear the tapes, as it were, um, in the Nixon library. But he, his language is unprintable because he really believed that the uh, Langley, the headquarters of the CIA, was filled with Ivy League types who were out to get him and his uh, form of uh, his Republican politics. So I think it's a very bad lookout. Harold Wilson is a slightly different uh, case, I think. Um, it wasn't that um, Harold Wilson was not uh, prepared to work with and use intelligence from the British system. He was, and of course, from his wartime experiences, he knew very well how the system worked. It was that there was a very small number of renegade uh, counterintelligence officers or former counterintelligence officers who thought he was a Russian spy. And I recount this, this is my example in the book uh, of what happens when you get into conspiratorial frame of mind. The uh, uh, head of counterintelligence in the CIA, James Jesus Angleton, and his acolyte, the late Peter Wright at MI5, author of Spycatcher, um, they formed the firm view that Wilson had been recruited by the KGB. Um, they also then formed the view that the Director General and Deputy Director General of MI5 must also have been recruited by the KGB because they'd obviously covered it up. Uh, and then they concluded that Hugh Gateskill had been murdered by the KGB to allow Wilson to succeed and therefore to become Prime Minister. <laughs> and probably it all these these propositions all chain together so if you're absolutely convinced of your first prop everything else then follow and they ruin the careers of good intelligence officers by casting doubt on them uh, and the tragedy is that particularly for, for the uh, our friends in the united states in the cia that counterintelligence got such a bad name as a result of these excesses that when it turned out they did have a Russian mole, Aldrich James, they were rather slow to pick it up because they rather turned their face against aggressive counterintelligence after the uh, sort of uh, uh, phantasms of uh, uh, Angleton. You actually refer in, in your book, and I quote it, it's our own demons that are most likely to mislead us. And you talk also about uh, magical thinking. Um, how prevalent do you think that is? Well, to take the first, um, this is part of, you know, how do we get it wrong when we're trying to be objective and we're trying to produce Joint Intelligence Committee reports, or you're trying to decide which car to buy and you've gone on different sites and you've got too much data and you're trying to work it all out. Um, it's our own emotional prejudices, the way we frame some of these issues that matter. And uh, because these are unconscious, they're quite difficult to pin down. But there's a huge volume of a huge amount of scientific evidence from psychological experiments that how you frame the issue really, really matters. Um, so uh, it's a, we need to know ourselves. If you're going to take good decisions, we all know, what, you know, know yourself like the physician's Delphic command, know yourself, um, which I think uh, uh, any good, anybody who's got serious uh, decisions to take should look inwards first uh, and so try and work out their emotional take before they plunge in to some expensive purchase or move house or whatever it, it might be. Now, the second one you mentioned, was 
I think I was quoting from the book, it's our demons that are most likely yeah. to mislead us. No, the, 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 the other one. You, you... The magical thinking. Oh, magical thinking, yes. Uh, which is not, it's not one of my 10 lessons, but it's my observation that uh, particularly uh, in a media fueled world, the political class uh, is, likes to put out their view of what needs to be done uh, as this is what will be done without working backwards. How is it going to be done? How long will it take? How much will it cost? Are the resources actually available? So you announce something like the track and trace system, the expansion or whatever, and you just hope that somebody else is going to be able to work out how to do it. And it's if you don't have in your mind that solid connection between what it is you want to do mm -hmm. and how on the ground it's actually, who are the people, where are they? Where's the money? How is it actually going to happen? This is where this magical thinking um, comes in. And you, I'm afraid we see rather a lot of it uh, mm -hmm. uh, around all the time. And say, I'm not making a party political point. It's, it's <laughs> in a media world where you have to capture the media with something uh, eye-catching. Uh, the temptation, I describe it, I think, as it's like building a, a, a brick wall from the top row of bricks downwards. So that you, you, you hold up the top row with faith, you know, it will get done. And you rely on other people to fill in underneath. And sometimes it doesn't happen and you just can't do it and the thing falls in. There are so many other questions we could ask about, about your book. As I said at the beginning, I hope people buy it and find it as fascinating as, as I have. Uh, I had to read it fairly quickly. I'll go back to it and read it in more detail after talking to you today. But I think we've now run out of time. Um, I've got one more question that's just come in. And because it comes from uh, Tom King, Lord King, uh, he asks, what assessment do you make of the prospects for five eyes and EU cooperation on intelligence post-Brexit? Very quickly, uh, I think the Five Eyes are in as good a shape as they've ever been, and probably rather better. So I have no real worries on the Five Eyes score. On the EU, if we are talking about traditional intelligence from in national intelligence agencies, including on terrorism, uh, intelligence security agencies, I have no doubts, no particularly worries. It will continue. We will, these are bilateral links or they work outside the EU through the Club of Bern. They will continue at every confidence and it's in everyone's interests. What won't continue unless somebody actually gets an agreement signed and new arrangements set up is the law enforcement side. So all the information on criminal records and vehicle licenses, uh, DNA, suspect databases, all of the stuff that is today accessed by any part of the police service that has the need for it, the Schengen information system, all of that stops unless there's an alternative uh, arrangement. And as far as I know, not, there's no deal yet on the table. So I am very worried that uh, uh, our security, not on terrorism, because that's outside the system, that's catered for, but on uh, narcotics trafficking, people trafficking, cyber attacks, all these, uh, all these other areas of serious criminality, we will end up worse off because of Brexit, unless somebody gets the deal done. All the professionals that I talk to on both sides of the channel desperately want this. There's nobody arguing against it. But uh, we have little problems like the European Court of Justice and so on, and ways will have to be found. The enemy is always in the details. <laughs> David, you've been very good to us today. You've given us an ama amazingly interesting hour. Uh, I was 14 years on the Intelligence and Security Committee, and I think it would be a very good uh, thing for that committee if one of the first things members were given was a copy of this book so that they could start from the basis of your experience and knowledge to take their time on the committee forward but uh, thank you very very much indeed and I hope people do go out and buy the book thank you, thank you.
Thank you very um, much. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. It's been an excellent session to start on you. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I know some of you are going to leave us now. We're going to have a 15 minute break, uh, for whatever you want. And then please log in back at 1 p.m. for our next session, which is our foreign policy roundtable. But thank you so much.